Hi, everybody. This is Brendan Baylod from the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group. Um, welcome to uh, my new video today. It's uh, called Shipwrecks from Outer Space. And uh, if you're here because you are uh, hoping to uh, uh, learn about crashed uh, alien ships, uh, I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place. Uh, you'll need to change channels and go to one of the UFO sites for that. This is about uh, shipwrecks on the Great Lakes and uh, using some new remote sensing technologies uh, to find them and to tell their stories. So welcome everybody. Um, as, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a maritime historian uh, and I've been telling the uh, stories of uh, lost ships on the Great Lakes and documenting uh, those ships for the last 30 years. Um, it's been uh, something that I've really enjoyed doing, uh, uh, mostly as a hobby. I am, however, the uh, past president of the Wisconsin Underwater Archaeology Association, and I've I've written a few books on on the subject of Great Lakes shipwrecks and uh, done a few appearances on, on on television on the National Geographic Channel, History Channel, uh, Discovery Channel, and, and the Travel Channel. Uh, discussing different uh, aspects of Great Lakes maritime history as well as different shipwrecks, and so. The, the, the recent um, advent of technologies like uh, satellite imagery and particularly uh, Google Earth uh, got me really excited because a, a lot of, of, of people who, who, you know, basically were armchair historians have come out and started finding fairly important uh, shipwreck sites on the Great Lakes. Um, it, it's uh, you know, really a kind of an exciting time. Um, a few things have made this possible that you know uh, really would have prevented us from being able to do this before. Obviously, one is technology, right? I mean, um, the ability to actually uh, you know store that much data, to image the entire face of the Earth and store those images, um, has really been a fairly recent occurrence brought to us, you know, courtesy of uh, ever smaller uh, microchips and uh, larger and larger and cheaper and cheaper data storage. However, um, the, really the main thing that's happened is the uh, advent of invasive species on the Great Lakes, which isn't necessarily a good thing. It's, it's really a double-edged sword. Um, zebra and quagga mussels came to the Great Lakes, oh gosh, must be going on 20, 25 years ago now, and very quickly carpeted the, the bottoms and all the shipwrecks on the southern Great Lakes, with the exception of Lake Superior, which is too cold and too deep and uh, to really sustain uh, large colonies of those uh, European mussels, which are really native to the Baltic Sea. Well, those mussels filtered the water column of the southern Great Lakes, and uh, the visibility in the Great Lakes shouldn't historically be much more than about 10 feet um, because of all the suspended zooplankton and benthic life. However, uh, we now have visibility approaching 100 feet in some parts of the Great Lakes, where these wrecks that we used to be able to, you know, we call them, we used to call the braille dives, you'd go down and, you know, you maybe you couldn't see anything, but you sort of feel there was a ship there. <laughs> Um, now you can hover over those ships, you know, 50 feet above them and see from end to end of a 120 foot shipwreck, you know. So it's been a stunning change and in some sense good for divers, bad for the ecosystem. Uh, we've experienced a crash of many uh, species, obviously things that eat zooplankton, the small fish have impacted the larger fish. We've, we've lost the sport fishing uh, economy in Lake Huron because uh, the populations of fish have crashed. But you can see those shipwrecks from outer space now. <laughs> so that's what I'm here to talk about. This is going to be a deep dive, uh, pun fully intended, into the use of these technologies to, uh, to find shipwrecks. So a couple other things have happened too, in addition to the uh, the invasives that have made this possible. Um, as a result of the you know, changing climate, um, we have seen dramatic changes in water levels on the Great Lakes. So we went from record low water levels just a few years ago, now to record high water levels. And what that's doing is it's displacing a lot of uh, sand that's been accumulated uh, for many years, and we are seeing the emergence of a lot of historic wrecks from sandbars on the Great Lakes and from beaches. And a lot of these are being found, uh, not surprisingly, uh, from outer space, 
because these are in areas where, you know, we don't normally go. A lot of parts of the Great Lakes are fairly remote and uh, they don't normally get seen other than perhaps by people who are looking at them from outer space. So let's talk a little bit about the history of, uh, of aerial um, aerial photography on the Great Lakes and what, what was and, and, and is available. Um, a couple of interesting uh, places you can go to find uh, historical information. Um, let's go and take a look. So here in Wisconsin, where I'm based, we have uh, a pretty good collection of historical aerial photos. And if you wanted to find historical aerial photos, you can go here to the State Cartographer's Office and you can find uh, all of the historical um, aerial images that were ever made. They have a catalog and it turns out that the earliest parts, the earliest photography on the state of the state from the air was done in 1937. And you can search for those historical images um, and they go, uh, let's look at Door County here. Um, we can see that in the summer of 38, we have some 1951, 54, 67, and on up through uh, the modern era. And a lot of these are high resolution uh, as we start to get into the more recent uh, um, filmings, uh, very high resolution. And so, you know, you can really see a lot in these uh, and you can go back quite a ways. Um, the earlier photographs aren't necessarily that useful for finding things such as uh, shipwrecks because they're, they're quite a ways, uh, they're from quite an elevation. They're not, obviously not high resolution. But you can see the, the courses of rivers. You can see changes in shoreline formations. You can see changes in harbors. Um, and it's a little more accurate than looking at maps because these are actual photos of what was there. And so most states have a similar thing. They have a, a, a aerial pho photography catalog. And, uh, and you can look at these. Uh, I don't know that every state has gone as far as Wisconsin has in, um, you know, uh, making them publicly available and, and particularly digitally available to people like this. But um, the main takeaway from this, I think, for people should be that we do have a lot of historical aerial photography available to us um, if you want to go back and look at things in the 50s or in the 60s and see what they looked like. However, um, if you don't uh, want to go back that far, if you want to, you know, do what I call uh, armchair wreck hunting, which... Uh, to be quite honest with you, is highly addictive. <laughs> you can lose hours, you can even lose days to it. Uh, there are a couple different things that you can use, but the main thing that's out there now is obviously Google Earth. And, uh, you know, uh, Bing for a while had some, uh, some pretty good uh, imagery. They removed it. Um, there's some scientific mapping that's been done as well. Uh, there are a number of agencies that are mapping the lakes primarily to look for harmful algal blooms. Now, they also map with a lot greater frequency than Google Maps does. Google Earth, you know, if, you'll see the images are sort of separated by a number of years. A lot of the scientific agencies, you know, are doing flyovers weekly and collecting that data now. Now, the, and it, most of it's publicly available, but it's not, you know, available on a, on a real nice interface like Google Earth. The other issue is that a lot of it is not being done with the type of opacity, and that's a term that uh, I'm going to use a lot, um, that's needed to look through the water column. In many instances, these types of images are more looking for the color. They're looking for, you know, surface density. They're looking for other things. They're not trying to penetrate the water. So even though we have, you know, fairly frequent up to weekly uh, digital images being made by satellites of the Great Lakes, not all of that data is being stored in high resolution and not all of it is being done at the uh, image wavelengths or the color wavelengths that, that uh, we're trying to, de to get to look at Great Lakes shipwrecks. But that's an important point. Um, so what we really want to do is we want to look at Google Earth. So let's, uh, let's bring it up. This is quite an app. So I'm using the desktop version of Google Earth. This is called Google Earth Pro. It's free. You can just download it. And here it comes. 
So we're going to take a look at Google Earth, and I'm going to give you a little tour of it. You can see all my top secret targets that I'm going to zoom by so you can't find them. <laughs> no, they're not all secret. I share my, uh, my information pretty freely. And here we have a historic shipwreck. This is uh, Port Inland. It is a big limestone processing facility in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, just inside of Sulchwa Point. Um, and just give you an idea of where we are. Uh, again, since I zoomed in kind of fast. And this is the wreck of the schooner Granger. She uh, dragged ashore here in the 1890s. And uh, I'm going to uh, do a little walkthrough of the functionality that we have in uh, Google Earth for finding shipwrecks. So it's got a couple of things. We have this place bar here where you can store your targets that you want to mark as you find them. And we have this layers bar here. Generally speaking, we can shut off all the layers. We are not interested in seeing all the, the marks on land. We just want to look at what, what, what nature is proving us in the image. So uh, I don't look too much at that. I do have my targets laid out, though. Um, a couple of other things that a lot of people don't use a lot, but I, I do, are these bars up here. So if you wanted to mark a target, say I wanted to mark that little thing there, you're going to hit this pin mark here and it's going to give you a pin. It's going to give you GPS coordinates. And you can also see them down here um, in the lower right-hand corner. You can see the date of the image that we're looking at from space, and you can see the GPS as I move here, which is pretty cool. And you can see the elevation we're viewing from, which is also kind of cool. But if I wanted to mark this image, what I would do is I'd hover over this and I'd drag it right to here. You can see the GPS is changing up there as I move. What I like to do to show these is I like to, and I wish they would just name the image um, the GPS coordinates or give you an option to do that, but I'm going to cut and paste those in there just because that's what I like to do. And I might make a note, you know, uh, my tech test. And so here we have it. There's my new, my new image of, uh, of a new wreck that I think I found. And it probably isn't actually a wreck, but... Uh, we're going to zoom in. If you zoom in too far, it's going to go horizontal, um, which I don't really like that much. But uh, you can get right up to it. But then, boom, you go horizontal. Uh, you want to return, you exit that, come back up. All right. So we're looking at shipwrecks here. One of the things that you can do with a shipwreck, um, it's kind of interesting, is you can um, measure it. Right? And so if we come over here, we have a ruler. How long is this? You can choose miles if you want to see how far it is from one point to another. But we're going to use feet, obviously, for this guy. How long is this shipwreck? This shipwreck is approximately 158 and change, maybe 155. It turns out the, the Granger is exactly 155 feet measured build. And you can see she's got a center port board trunk in her even here from the air, which is kind of cool. So that's really useful to help tell uh, how big a shipwreck is. And you may ask, well, how do I know that that's accurate, right? Is that really 155 feet? You can measure against a known target. Um, this is a limestone carrier, and I, I can't remember which one she is, but I, I did know at the time I found that wreck, and I thought, well, I should really check and see um, how long she is. And turns out Google Earth is dead accurate. Um, this ship is... Uh, right around 690 feet long, um, which is exactly how long this ship is. Um, so I checked on the, the date of the filming of the image, 5-8-2016, and was able to figure out which ship that was. All right, so that's kind of cool. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the limitations before I dive into some more features. Um, there are some problems that you run into frequently with using these aerial images to find shipwrecks. And one of them you can see right here in this image, and that is surface turbulence. The opacity of the water is directly impacted by this surface turbulence. Here, we can see every board on the bottom move over a little bit. All of a sudden, you can't see anymore, right? And that's the reflectivity of the light. It's not very opaque. And that's a problem with a lot of images. They're just not sufficiently opaque. If we zoom out, there are a couple other things. I don't, I don't really see too many of them here. I'm going to show you another wreck. Um, one of the other big issues you run into is cloud cover. I'm not seeing a lot of cloud cover right now. 
you need you also need enough bandwidth i should i should add as well to really be able to see this stuff in high def um so but cloud cover is an issue um also not all the films are very opaque um there are some films that are notoriously bad uh some seasons so i'm going to show you uh the wayback machine here is what i call it i'm going to go back up to Solchwa, back up to the granger all right so this is the Wayback Machine. Uh, if you click this button, it's going to enable the showing of historical imagery. So the first thing you get here is you get today's date, 3-2-2020. If you click back one more, it's going to not change the date, but it's going to show you the date of the image you're looking at. So this was filmed on May 8, 2016. I want to go back to the previous imagery that Google has. Google has May 15th, 2013, five years earlier. This image shows the wreck is a little more deeply buried, I think, just her gunnels are showing. It's not, the surface opacity isn't as good. You can see that. Um, and some of the, you know, other marks that we originally found are just gone, showing that they're probably not a shipwreck. It was probably just vegetation or, you know, collected debris inside of a low area. Let's go back another another um, session, another filming session, and we see that we've lost resolution, the water level is considerably lower, and we have almost no opacity. So we can't really use this set, image set for anything. And if we zoom out, we kind of see that that's the state of affairs in general. Now, one of the things to remember, uh, but the way this works is Google has multiple layers of images in here. So the image changes as you move out. This is a top layer. It's from a different date. It's from 6, 2011. As we zoom in, the, the date sometimes changes. I, I'm seeing it's not changing here, but, but oh yeah, well, the slider's changing. So you do get different dates. The, the, the different layers are on different dates. But so you see that image isn't particularly useful. Let's go back another uh, series. Now we're back in 2006. This will give you a really good idea. There's no op opacity here, not because the water was all blue, but because they just didn't record that data. They blanked that out because they didn't want to take up the disk space, which was an issue back in 2006. So only the very close shoreline material. Let's go back another season or series. Here we can see just a smudge of where that ship was back in 2005. Come back another uh, earlier in 2005 there, you can see that it was still somewhat visible, just uh, in outline. And then if we come back to, to 1999, we can see it was there still. There's still darkness. There was a ship there. This is black and white, obviously. And, uh, you know, it's pretty good resolution. Uh, the opacity, frankly, isn't terrible. Now, one of the weaknesses of all the Google Earth films is that they really lose it not too far from shore. So it looks like this is all bottom views. This isn't. This is, you know, mostly cloud cover. If you zoom in on this, there's no lower level. You can't get the imagery. That's annoying. Here's a good case in point. So this is Pelkey Reef, uh, the the steamer Oscoda is wrecked on there. I'd like to see it. I know it's there. But look at that. There's a cutoff line. So you don't get to see it because it's just a few hundred yards too far from shore. So that's another one of my pet peeves. You know, obviously we can't see that. Um, but you can see some tremendous detail in other areas, you know, of the nearby lake if you wanted to look for historic vessel remains, right? And there are plenty. Um, so let's move along. Um, I've talked about some of the issues that we have. We've got, you know, issues with resolution, cloud cover, opacity, also seasonal changes. Um, you know, depending on what season you're looking, the water can be really clear or the water can be really, really uh, turbid. It has to do with runoff from these rivers. Here you see a different colored water. That's, uh, you know, tannic acid coming from, you know, vegetation. When uh, in the in the spring and after heavy snows or after heavy rains, you really, really, uh, the lake will get really clouded up. 
because it'll it'll fill this whole bay, you know, in some instances with runoff from these rivers. In this instance, because we're in May, that's kind of the ideal time for this, uh, and that's you know, part of the reason why they try to do it in May, is they want to um, get the best imagery they can. A um, couple other things to keep in mind. Um, we can't see very deep in the water, even in, even in, in the best of conditions, right? We start getting downwards of about, oh, 30 feet, 40 feet of water, and we're really not seeing what we think we're seeing. Um, and I'll demonstrate that in a little bit. Um, also, there are plenty of these images where there's ice covering the lake. Um, they've taken some in the winter, although not, not the more recent ones. So that's another thing to keep in mind. You know, if you're looking in the winter, you may get a lot of ice cover. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you some techniques that we use for, uh, you know, finding uh, shipwrecks and some of the caveats for how to do it. Here are some islands in Lake Michigan that are filthy with shipwrecks. Okay. This is the Fox Islands, and the foxes are just a hotbed of unidentified shipwrecks. Um, so the thing we want to do when we want to scan for shipwrecks is we want to find the best image series for the area we're in and the date we're in. So this looks pretty good. If we come down here, there is some, some surface uh, opacity trouble, but not too much. We're, we're generally seeing pretty well. So let's zoom in on this known target here. This is a wreck. Uh, a big uh, shipwreck um, that is, she's a big steamer, um, the Vega. Uh, she's a steel-hulled vessel. She's quite large. How large is she, you might ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. The Vega is darn near 300 feet long. I think she was uh, historically. And there's a lot to her. She's in about 20 to 30 feet. And so you can see how you lose resolution when you start getting deeper. Let's take a look and see if we can find a better image. Yeah, see, that's not a good one. So you can see how the opacity changed, right? We don't see into the water well, but it's not just the opacity, it's the vis, the visibility. The water is cloudier here. That was in July of 2019, so not to, not to be surprised at that in July you don't see as well. You really want May. This one was August 2014. Ah, 5-2012. So 5, 2000, the 2012 series is notoriously good, actually. And here you can actually see structure of this shipwreck on the bottom. So I, I think this is the one I'm going to use for scanning. So key to looking for shipwrecks is to get low in the water, right? You need to really get down there to where you can see detail. So I'm starting to see rocks, right? A question to ask yourself is, you know, if there was a 70-foot a, a keel, would you know it? Would you be able to see it? You know, you have to know how high up you are. And the way I do it is I look at shore and I look at the treetops. If I if a 20-foot if a treetop is about yay far apart, I, I'm, I know I'm looking close enough down where I could see a keel. If I'm, you know, too far in, you know, you're not looking efficiently. You're, you're really looking at small areas and maybe if you're looking for something really small, you want to do that. But there's no reason to go that small. You want to be able to find stuff without having to look too much. I would say this is too far up. Like you're not going to see a shipwreck. You want to get down there, about there. And again, you have to ground truth. That's an important concept when you're looking is to ground truth. You want to look at a known thing. Rocks are a good thing to use. If you can see rocks, you're at the right level, right? Now we can start to see that we're losing our opacity here. It's getting much worse because we're getting out of the lee of the island. There's getting to be some wind. And now this isn't very useful anymore. You probably maybe will spot, spot a shipwreck, but not, not too easily, right? So there's an interesting target right there. And I don't have that marked. So what you want to do when you see something that interests you is you want to check other years. Oh, there's something there in 14. And of course, that last year wasn't so good. But that's interesting, whatever it is. Let's keep uh, looking. Let's look back one more generation. 2011 is an awful year. 
2005, and you, you generally aren't going to get something, get anything useful if you go back too far. So, uh, it's fairly linear. And then what you want to do, another important concept in finding shipwrecks, because ostensibly you're going to visit this someday, or somebody's going to want to visit it and ground truth it, and you don't want to waste a lot of t people's time and gas. So what you want to do is you want to see if this looks like other things in the area that aren't shipwrecks. So we have this sort of line here, right? That's probably not a shipwreck. It's probably just a, you know, anomaly. You see a rock here that shows up pretty good, you know. The other thing you want to ask yourself is, is this in an area where it would likely strand, you know? Um, I would say yes. See, we have a spit of land coming out here. We're getting, you know, into some shallows. It does look like a likely area. One other thing to keep in mind when you find something like this is wrecks usually are broken up in shallow water, and sometimes there's big pieces a ways out. So you want to look seaward uh, from it, see if there's anything else on the bottom. So this is sort of interesting here. And I don't have very good visibility there. So I really only have these two filmings, or that one filming that's any good in this area. And that's too bad. Um, I am going to mark this. So what I'm going to do yeah, because it looks interesting. It looks like it could be a keel, albeit kind of broken up. I'm um, going to mark that. So that's an example of how you scan for shipwrecks and how you try to find something that might be a shipwreck. And I, honest to God, just found this cold. Uh, I just happened to be recording. I didn't plan that. Uh, it looks like it might be a shipwreck. But I'm going to show you some of the some of the perils of of this. Um, you wanna you wanna obviously be careful as you search so that you're you know you're looking at stuff. I'm gonna show you something in this filming here that demonstrates one of these principles. This is a wreck called the Falcon. She was a big steamer built as uh, the Kate Butteroni. Uh, really interesting and uh, historic wreck. Um, and so, pardon me, I'm gonna have to pause. All right, I just am, uh, took a little break and I'm resuming now. Uh, just going to continue on. It'll be interesting to see if this video picks up uh, and stays on the other one. All right, so we've been looking at a couple of wrecks here. Uh, this is the wreck of the Falcon a steamer that went ashore here on uh, South Fox Island. And um, she uh, is a good example of a wreck that is easy to miss um, from a higher level. She disappears pretty quickly. I didn't find this piece. I found this piece first because I was going by at about this level and I ran it over. And you could see that it was clearly a shipwreck. Um, this is a good example of uh, a wreck that shows us two different important concepts. The biggest concept it shows us is where to look, right? You can see that it's deep down here. A ship isn't going to strand down here in this deep water. Um, what we see is there's like a hump right here where it gets much shallower suddenly. And not surprisingly, that's where we find the ship's hull bed. Uh, she fetched up by coming ashore here where the depth comes up. And, you know, they couldn't get her off because she was obviously lodged on some rocks. Um, but we see a couple other things that happen. This ship broke up pretty badly. And uh, another thing that I didn't even notice when I first found her is her boiler is still there. And that's a big boiler. Um, if you wanted to uh, check it out, the, uh, the size of the ship uh, is, is actually quite large herself. She is uh, uh, almost uh, 200 feet in length. Uh, the boiler um, is also quite large. Um, I hate this tool. It is uh, 12 feet across, so really good size boiler. Uh, but then the other thing that this demonstrates, too, is that, you know, uh, the wreckage becomes disarticulated. So there's a debris field probably going all the way to shore here. So we see this is a side, I believe, of the ship here that we see. There's another uh, piece of wood here from the ship. And then if we go in shore a little bit further, we have another piece of debris. Now, I'm a little bit unclear. I, I do think that's the other side, actually, in retrospect, because it looks just like 
the uh, the side out here in terms of its layout, and then this is the hull bed. So, and it's about the right size. So we can see that uh, not only did she fetch up where it gets shallow, so that's where you want to be looking, but then you want to follow uh, that debris path inward. So I'll show you one other that is quite a, a difficult wreck to see, and I found this by doing low and slow searching. Um, you can probably see her because I put the pin on her, but uh, I'm already down near tree height, right? And you could be forgiven for not seeing this. If you zoom straight in, what we see is a fairly degraded old keel. Um, and uh, for the most part, I've identified these wrecks. Off the top of my head, I can't remember which one this is, but there aren't that many options. Um, this is a good-sized, heavily built keel, and... Uh, She's probably, let's see what we're looking at here. I think she was around the 75 foot range. Oh no, 45, 50 feet only. Um, so I think this is potentially an early schooner. I would like to know what this is. I've never actually gotten down there to the foxes. The foxes are notoriously uh, difficult to uh, get to because they don't have any dockage. Neither one of the fox islands do. And uh, they're quite a, a, a good distance from civilization, as you can see. But it's probably, a, uh, could be a, an historically important schooner, I think, and uh, certainly remains um, largely unidentified. So um, that is a, a good overview of how to use the tool. A couple other things that I use sometimes are this sunlight feature. Um, you can, you know, turn it to different light conditions if you want. You can uh, give it specific times of day that you want to uh, emulate. I tend to look at full light. Uh, that tends to, for, for, for me, to be the best uh, light to use. Um, there are a few other things you can do. You can turn on uh, grid lines, which are kind of cool, if you want to see, you know, GPS uh, more specifically. That's sort of cool for some people. You can do an overview map, um, you know, a number of different things. But um, I personally uh, don't use a whole lot of the gimmicks um, on here. It's pretty straightforward. And I keep a pretty good library of, uh, of different uh, shipwrecks that I, not just shipwrecks, but, you know, interesting looking debris, right? I, if I find something that I think, you know, well, it could be a shipwreck. Maybe it's not. Hard to say, hard to tell. Um, South Fox Island is really notoriously filthy with shipwrecks. Um, North Fox is too. Um, there's a couple of sites on South that I am quite interested in. And I'll show you the difference. One of the key things to know is what something that's not a wreck looks like. Now, we're looking here right where it gets shallow, right? So I'm looking in the right place. And I've got this sort of, you know, thing here, this thingy. Uh, and if I look at it, you know, you can't see it in subsequent seasons. I would like to get another season that has good visibility to see if that's anything. It's a little um, a little linear. Now, I'll compare and contrast that with something that I do think is a shipwreck. This, I think, is a shipwreck. She's a little deep, but you get the idea. Where this stands up and it's got this long straight thing, it looks like a hull. And if I measure it, you know, it's around 100 feet. And uh, I, that's the size range you want. One of the things that I've found oftentimes is that things that I think are shipwrecks, turns out they can't be because they're way too big. Uh, it's easy to lose scale when you're looking at at, at this type of information and, and think that you're looking at a shipwreck. Um, I'll show you a good case in point. This is one that everyone gets wrong. Um, this is Iron, Iron Ore Bay at the south end of uh, Beaver Island. And we see here a very well-known wreck. This is the Bessie Smith. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful image of her on this particular filming. You can really, really see the detail. A lot of people know this particular image. Um, here we have this uh, really big structure that uh, oftentimes is uh, confused uh, for being a shipwreck. And one of the ways we rule that out is we can measure it. And so if we measure that structure, we see that it is uh, almost 500 feet long. And we know that there's no ship that size that wrecked anywhere near here. Turns out it's a crib dock. 
um, a big crib dock that came out into uh, Iron Ore Bay. And there were a lot of historic vessels wrecked here. But the beavers are a notorious area for uh, shipwreck furniture. <laughs> and most of the ships that, that it stranded here were cut up eventually uh, to make shipwreck furniture. Um, the most notable being the Milwaukee Bell. Um, she has some very, very fine debris in here, uh, some pieces of wood, etc., right in that area. Uh, but that's about it. So that's one way we can rule out things that are in shipwrecks is by, you know, basically getting their size. Um, all right. Let's talk about identification. Um, how do you know, uh, you know, say you find one of these, you know. Um, an important understanding, I think, for everybody is that most of these wrecks are identified already, um, you know. Uh, and as much as we'd like to think we may have found something new, in many cases we haven't. So if we come down here, you know, um, this th these wrecks that are off of North Fox Island, for example, are fairly well identified already. What you want to do is you want to look, um, if the wreck is in an underwater preserve or in, an, in a marine sanctuary, generally speaking, it's probably documented. Um, however, if you don't know, um, you should look at that. There are plenty of dive guides out there. And you can also look at historical losses that occurred in the given area. Uh, there are a number of uh, websites. Dave Swayze's uh, shipwreck list is out there on his website. And there are also a couple others that you can use, uh, Pat Labadee's um, database. And uh, particularly Walter Lewis's site, too, has a, a nice geographical search interface on it um, where you can look at things by, by location, uh, marine accidents. And you should be able to identify them. If you can't, feel free to post them to our news group, uh, to the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group. But when you do it, I'd prefer that you put the location like this and give a good view from above to and maybe inset it so we can see where you're talking about. Because nobody wants to have to, you know, try to find the wreck and spend 10 minutes scanning the area to relocate it. Um, and many times, um, you know, we can tell you pretty quickly uh, what the ship is. So um, that's a good courtesy, you know, put a little effort into it before you, uh, before you uh, post it. Um, what do you do if you find a new one? Well, um, generally speaking, uh, a lot of times these wrecks, even though nobody knows it in the general public, they are known to the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, if you're in Michigan, uh, I, I always send a, a quick email with, a, with an image, uh, just out of courtesy to the uh, uh, state program. Um, right now, Wayne Lasardi is the state uh, uh, historic preservation officer working with shipwrecks in Michigan. And I send him a courtesy email if I think I found something new. But I only do that once I've done due diligence. So I would uh, post it on our news group. And if nobody there knows it, you know, at all, and you never, and, and I don't know it, then, you know, probably time to alert the state that potentially we have a new wreck. Um, and they're interesting, you know, if we can't identify it, that, that would be something that I'd be interested in. If you find a new one that, that we don't know what it is, uh, I'd be happy to help identify it. I'm pretty good at that. So um, what does the future hold for, you know, this sort of Great Lakes, uh, you know, shipwreck hunting from outer space? Well, a couple of things, I think. Um, we got new new series of lake maps or, or of image images coming out, right? Here we have the, the 2019 that just came out. We're hoping that we get an annual uh, an annual map. So, right with this this set, for your example, doesn't have good opacity. We had a little bit of um, a little bit of uh, surface reflection on here. It, not the best. What we really want is we want uh, more frequent uh, releases, and I think they're going to be. Um, it would be. I think we, we're going to be seeing that. I also think we're going to see higher resolution images and better images. And I think we're going to uh, see better surface opacity uh, in the near future for these uh, these rack uh, sites that are in the water so that we'll be able to see deeper in the water than before. Um, I, I would guess that in the next 10 years, you're going to see better than annual, perhaps even monthly images because you know disk space is so cheap. The other thing that I think would be nice, and I don't know if there's a community way to do it, is to have a community version of Google Earth where we can all post our um, our pins, 
you know, and we can start to document all these sites that we know about, you know, uh, and people can start to share. And I think that would be a good thing. I don't know that we currently have that uh, or the ability to do that, but there are definitely some wrecks that uh, would be nice to be able to share with people, especially things that become buried, like this guy here on South Fox. This is definitely a schooner. Uh, Keelan ribs here, no doubt about it. She's got the, the keel. And if you look in the most recent filming, she's gone. Um, she got buried again. So it would be good to record these if we can, um, because they do go away, and they're only uncovered, um, you know, infrequently from year to year, especially when the water gets low like this. They, they, they get unburied. So that is how we uh, look for shipwrecks from outer space, folks. Um, feel free to give us a try if you want to do it. Uh, look in your area. Uh, I'm just looking at the islands in Lake Michigan, and as you can see, it's just filthy with, uh, with shipwrecks. But there are many other areas, you know, if we zoom in over here i can show you that uh there's a a wreck you know we don't know what she is but definitely a good sized piece of hull remains there um and they're all over the place um it doesn't take long uh to look for wrecks in your area so uh, i gotta warn you uh it is addictive um you can lose a lot of time doing this <laughs> but uh, feel free to participate in the community let us know if you find anything uh, feel free to post your, your findings, but when you do, uh, just remember, uh, put in some due diligence to see if you can find, uh, you know, if, it, if it's a known rack, obviously, um, still you can post it. You know, it's nice to have good aerial pictures, but we do uh, appreciate if you if you'd help us identify them. So, uh, exciting area of uh, inquiry. Uh, stay tuned, and uh, because you're going to see this uh, technology improve, and uh, you're going to see more and more racks be found this way. Um, and it's a fun way to, to learn about maritime history and to try to find shipwrecks. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to get in touch with me through the Great Lake Shipwreck Research Group. I'm the administrator there, and you can uh, quite easily find me. Um, you can email me at uh, brendan at baylaw.com. I'm always ha happy to meet new people and, uh, and chat about this stuff. So thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the video.